people operate. I, I can't picture it myself. Uh, well, hopefully, well, I'll tell you this much. If um, they get the benefits and pay they do now, I'm so totally going to run for Congress under that scenario. <laughs> uh, what would probably happen is it would probably operate a lot more like a, um, a, a British Parliament you would probably have factions that would build and coalitions that would build. It would be very confused. And it would probably have a lot of congressmen who don't have a lot of power. You'd also have a lot of dead wood. Not that there isn't dead wood in Congress. But you'd also have a lot of activist movements. It basically, what it would do is congressmen would no longer have the individual power they wield. I mean, let's face it. Under that system, we'd have as many county commissioners, basically, as we do congressmen. You know, one gets to go to Washington and gets to go to fancier parties, but basically they'd be interchangeable. And you'd see a lot more individuals running from a lot of different things. Basically, it would upset the apple cart, in my opinion. And this is what they intended, our founders. They, would, they really wanted congressmen. The whole idea, one of the reasons the way they set it up was, you know, the balance of power between the states and the, and the, and the people. But they really wanted congressmen to be very close to the people. They wanted to be so close that they could be voted out like that, that they had to be very responsive, that they could really respond quickly, that they really were close to the people. They wanted them to be truly the voice of the people. Senators, six-year terms, elected by the legislature, pretty much untouchable in their six-year terms, that was the whole idea that, you know, hopefully these folks will be the products of a long political system, They'll be more seasoned. They'll be more politically astute. And because they have six-year terms, usually coming after, the, after a long political career at the state level, that these folks were really more untouchable. They could be the ones that could sit back and deliberate and fly in the face of the people. Hence the, the famous phrase, I think it was Jefferson, I might be wrong on this, said, the Senate is the saucer in which you cool the, 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 the drink of the house. The idea was one was to be of the people, rabble rousing. The other one was to be more stately, more distant, more contemplative. That was the philosophical intent. So yeah, it's going to be a mess, but it was supposed to be a mess. And I for one think it would be kind of fun. Now that we've tried this, do you think there are people out there that think we're worse off than before the 17th Amendment with the problems that brought on the 17th Amendment? <coughs> yes and no. The the real debates on the 17th Amendment really haven't emerged until recently. Um, it, it really came in when people were looking at the 10th Amendment problems. You know, why are states getting steamrollered by the federal government? And that's when they realized, hey, wait a minute, maybe the 17th Amendment wasn't such a good idea. The, I think the problem was is that the Senate is always, you know, politicians have been corrupt from time immemorial. That's not going to change. So, the, and the point is, is we have corrupt senators today, and, uh, I mean, John Murtha was notoriously corrupt. And, um, you know, there was, uh, like I said, the, the, the folks that published in Cosmopolitan, they were equally corrupt. These scandals were real. So I think political corruption is going to be a fact of life. What I would hope, and what was true back then, is when the federal government was smaller is the scope of their damage was much less limited and the impact on their lives was much less limited. And that was actually one thing that got a lot of these progressive movements through is back then nobody really knew what the unintended consequences would be. Because back then, Washington was as far away as we think of, say, Beijing or Moscow today. It's, it's like the other side of the world. Things in Washington didn't affect the person in Missouri or Florida. So that was the change. We'll so the problem's have, there, yeah. We we'll probably have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, a comment. Oh, oh, maybe waiting for one of the conservative justices to die. Do you have any, con any thoughts about nullification? Um, controversial. Uh, the, the nullification, I assume we're talking about jury nullification? Or? Uh, nullification, uh, well, basically, congressional nullification by the states. Um, I, it would be interesting to say that the reason that it hasn't been very practical is because there's usually money attached. I mean, we saw nullification today, at, with or was it yesterday, with Rick Scott saying, no, 
That would be very good. The problem, though, is, is that they don't want to say no to Obamacare because they get so much Medicaid funding and Medicare funding, and they know there will be political fallout. It's the purse strings and the mandates that are there. And there's also the threat of litigation, although that has diminished recently with Arizona and illegal immigration and the Obamacare litigation. The willingness of courts, of states to battle it out in court with the federal government is dying. But it's really budgets. And uh, you got to remember, even in the Florida legislature, people have gotten attached to those budgets. So I think it's a great idea, and I think the Tenth Amendment really needs to be supported by it. But I also realize that it's going to be an uphill battle. Um, I think Obamacare is really the first step in that. Uh, I think illegal immigration with the Arizona case is really the second step in that. Um, and I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens. And I think you're absolutely right. They would, the, the Supreme Court is on such a balance. One car accident could change everything. Thank you, Thank so you very much. much.